Hi everyone, it's Stephanie uh, with The Patient Story. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm thrilled with our special guest today, Dr. David Nicholas. Um, he's the Associate Chief Blood and Marrow Transplantation at Stanford and also the Clinical Director of the Cancer Cell Therapy Program, which focuses on immunotherapy and CAR-T. And how do you introduce yourself to people? <laughs> I'm a doctor, okay, I, I yeah, people good. who have cancer. And <laughs> Stephanie, thank you for this opportunity to speak to your patients. Uh, you have a tremendous following and um, it's really important that we get the information out to the patients and their families. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I'm really excited to have you. And so the first thing, um, Dr. Miklos, I just would love for you in layman's terms, um, you know, most people know what CAR-T you know, cell therapy is. There are a lot of exciting developments happening. Um, could you give us sort of a lay of the land? Sure, sure. Uh, Stephanie, uh, the uh, use of the patient's own lymphocytes, these are the immune cells that provide us our education. These are the things that we're talking about with COVID as whether or not you have antibodies or whether you have immune responses and how are we gonna vaccinate ourselves? So we understand the power of the immune system. We know that there were no antibiotics until 150 years ago. We know that we've had 10,000 generations of well, ponds gone, ponds come up to, uh, to human beings at this point in evolution, right? And all that depended on our immune system, but we haven't been able to harvest the immune system to cure these aggressive cancers uh, until now. So uh, the opportunities to try to vaccinate a cancer have really been disappointing. And so the general approach of the cancer cell therapy or the CAR-T program is to hijack the patient's own immune cells to remove the lymphocytes from the body using a very simple procedure, apheresis, just like you see in the Red Cross donation centers when patients are giving platelets. No pain, three hours, piece of cake. Take those cells into the laboratory and introduce a new gene it, we call that a chimeric antigen receptor, the CAR. And that modification of the lymphocytes becomes permanent in those cells, but it doesn't go into the rest of the body. You're not gonna become uh, GMO uh, like the corn in Iowa. We are modifying the lymphocytes and those supercharged cells after, again, one week of manufacturing, one week of safety evaluation in the lab are brought back to the patient, frozen in liquid nitrogen, liquid nitrogen is not just for ice cream. And those cells uh, then introduced back to the patient's body through the same catheter that the earlier lymphocytes came out. They expand from 2 million cells to 20 billion cells in seven days. It's variable depending on which cell therapy we're talking about, but think about that. That's cells dividing every seven hours. And frequently after a week of expansion, the CAR uh, modified T cells represent 50% of the white blood cells in the patient's body. And these are cells that can do four things that have never been done in cancer. These are cells that are proliferating in the patient's body, localizing to the tumor, able to kill with cytotoxic killing like we use for viruses, influenza, and then they persist providing you surveillance until the cancer's all gone. And in fact, some of these cars are designed to last for years. Others are designed to simply go away over the next uh, four uh, to 12 weeks. So that's the value of the excitement of the CAR-T program. It's a paradigm shift of using the patient's own lymphocytes to kill cancer with uh, all the power of the immune system in a way that was never done before. And again, this was pioneered by Dr. Carl June and Steven Rosenberg at the University of Pennsylvania and the National Cancer Institute, but really became available broadly to the lymphoma patients only in 2016. And so it's hard for me to remember before February of 2016 when we, trans when we treated our first patient here at Stanford, since now we are treating 120 patients this year at Stanford with the uh, CAR T cells, and we anticipate increasing about 50% per year. I want to stop there. That's, that's a great overview, actually. Thank you for painting that picture. I know um, you really boiled that down for us. And I, I also understand that some exciting new developments have been happening at Stanford. So let's go ahead and spotlight that with the CAR-22. Sure, sure. 
The initial work was targeting CD19. It's a, a series of cell surface proteins, and they have numbers. Why not just give them a number? So the B lymphocytes that are important in lymphoma and in leukemia were the first successful uh, use of CAR-T. Uh, we have three targets, 19, 20, and 22, for what it's worth. Most of your patients have had rituximab, rituximab being the monoclonal antibody. I'm sure they recognize that bottle that infuses over three to four hours of clear liquid. That's targeting CD20. But that's an antibody, right? You put the antibody in and it doesn't grow, it doesn't localize, it doesn't do any of those things we just said. It's effective, don't stop taking your rituximab, uh, important part of our therapy. But now we're able to go after additional targets. So uh, if a patient was treated with a AxiCell or Kimraya, Tissa cell, or soon a Lysacell from the Juno work that we expect to be FDA approved, those are three soon to be commercially approved. Um, AxiCell in October 2017 and Juno's Lysacell we expect later this month. Three CAR T cells commercially available that the doctors are choosing which one's the best for that patient, but they're all targeting the same protein. They're all using the same binder on the surface of the cell. They're all very similar actually. And so uh, creativity uh, means let's go after a new target. Um, one of the biggest problems our research has shown that the patients receiving the CAR therapies who have disease progression frequently two to three months afterwards, that progression happens in half the patients and half the patients have long persistent remissions that are out at three and four years now. But the patients who have the progression, why? Why did the CAR fail? What we're finding to be the most common reason is that the lymphoma cells, the cancer cells, stopped making the target. So what was there before as the target that the car bound onto and then interacted with and then was able to activate and kill, when the target disappears, the, the car has nothing to bind. And so antigen loss of CD19 uh, can only be overcome by going to a new target. So uh, here at Stanford, we have been fortunate with our uh, programmatic leader, Crystal Mackle, who came from the National Cancer Institute and has brought some of the basic science constructs that are necessary to move into these new targets. And we've had great success recently with a target of CD22. And so um, similar to the rest of the cars, it's a chimeric antigen receptor, uses the patient's own lymphocytes, harvested, but manufactured here at Stanford in our own GMP laboratory. The, the clean room laboratories like you see with Intel inside, the guys in the white uh, gown dancing around. That clean room mentality so that we can ensure that the virus goes into the lymphocytes, that it's safely uh, matured and that we collect enough cells after a week of production and we bring them back to the patient. And so the excitement here is that in patients who had progressive disease after AxiCell or Tissa cell, that we have witnessed uh, seven out of nine of these early patients on clinical trial achieving uh, responses, five out of nine in complete remission. And those durable remissions that are in our lead two, three patients are not out, now out to a year. They have very low toxicity, low cytokine release problems that your patients probably know that uh, what happens after cars, you feel like you have the flu with fevers and aches and sometimes low blood pressure and sometimes um, cough or high, low oxygenation, that we can manage that with steroids and a special drug called TOSI. And those toxicities are very low. So that's very exciting to us. Now, um, Please don't run out to all your local hospitals asking for CAR-22. This is an investigation being done here at Stanford where we are, again, um, able to uh, help patients who've had progression after AxiCell and patients do come from all over for this. Um, there are other clinical trials that are also targeting and helping uh, patients who have had progression after the commercially available. One of the most exciting areas there is instead of using the patient's own lymphocytes, why not take cells that haven't gone through two or three rounds of chemotherapy, haven't existed for 60 or 70 or 80 years in somebody's body? Why not take a 21-year-old super donor lymphocytes from somebody healthy and fit that have been made stealth-like by removing some of the histocompatibility markers, the immune cells that would be rejected? And, and those stealth cells are also expressing CAR T cells. Um, some of the companies that are doing this work are Precision Bioscience and Allogene. Um, they have different targets, CD19, CD20. And again, we're using um, 
those opportunities to help our patients here at Stanford. And I'm sure that some of your patients can find those locally in centers uh, near them. Mm -hmm. The allogeneic uh, approach is very exciting because you don't have to wait to make the cells. So you already have the cells in the liquid nitrogen freezer and it's kind of one size fits all and you know how good those cells are because you've seen them function in other patients previously. So there's potentially a lot of advantages to these allogeneic cells, but of course we have to make sure that they will grow and expand and not get immunologically rejected by the patient. So these are still early clinical trials, uh, but very exciting opportunities for patients who have not benefited completely, have not gotten a durable response from the CAR-Ts that are commercially available. That's how I think about the, uh, the development of CAR-T. I think we're going to talk more about going to other diseases besides aggressive large cell lymphoma, though. So I'll let you ask me the question. No, but that, that's great. I mean, I wanted to clarify that population for CAR-22. And as you said, you stress this is still uh, in trial, so it's not like it's available for people quite yet, right? That's right. These are clinical trials, which patients can come to centers, academic centers, and participate in clinical trials. And um, other centers are doing very exciting work. Please don't think that we have all the answers at Stanford. Um, again, there's very exciting work at, um, uh, you know, as you would imagine, the top 30 large cancer centers in this, uh, in this country, and we're very fortunate to have the support of the, you know, of the patients and their families. Perfect. Thank you so much. Look, I, I love that you're humble and there's a little bit of, you know, that caution, but it's exciting to hear any of these developments because these are options that just haven't been there for people. Oh, that's right. When, you know, in 2016, before we started our CAR therapies and what turns out to be AxiCell or the commercial trade name that you all know now as Yescarta, mm -hmm. um, the benchmark study of what happened to patients who didn't go on to CAR-T with relapse refractory lymphoma, who have had three lines of therapy previously, was dismal. Um, those were, uh, we, that was an experience we will never want to repeat. The median uh, time to progression, the median time to death was five to six months. And the one year survival was 15%. And now uh, with the approaches of uh, Yescarta, uh, Tisacel, uh, and I anticipate Lysacel, the one year survivals are 85%. And uh, we think that with having additional therapies that we can use in patients who are progressing, we're going for 100%, right? I mean, what's 85, who wants 85%, right? Let's go for 100%. Spoken like a true Stanford guy. <laughs> Get the A, not the B. No, um, no, but I agree. And, and it's, it's really thrilling to be able to hear about all of these developments. Um, so thank you for updating us on that. You know, shifting over, talking about um, a challenging po population of patients would be the refractory relapsed, um, you know, mantle cell lymphoma patients who you know, have had therapies available, but the long-term remissions not really as widely observed once they hit a certain number of, um, you know, different therapies. And so we wanted to spotlight the Zuma 2, which I know Stanford was a part of, that, that trial. Love to do that. Um, yeah, and, and then also, of course, the recent FDA approval of Ticardis to treat um, relapsed refractory MCL patients. So the mantle cell is kind of the story of my life. It's an <laughs> interesting story. When I was training back at Harvard in 1995, mantle cell was first being recognized because we needed some antibody tests to be able to tell the difference of these immature lymphocytes. And so mantle cell was first being recognized. And the very first patient I actually diagnosed when... Um, a person had lymphadenopathy in my internship clinic where usually I was treating diabetes, right? Or hypertension. And, and I happened to meet a patient and the therapy was terrible. And uh, using CHOP chemotherapy had only a three-year overall survival. Um, rituximab added very little to the benefits for those patients. But the development of small molecule inhibitors that are interfering with the signal from the B cell receptor to the division inside the nucleus, these, these are drugs that your, your people have heard of, abrutinib, uh, a drug that targets the, B, the Burton tyrosine kinase inhibitor, uh, as well as uh, other drugs that uh, are, again, abrutinib was the first, and abrutinib is certainly the most widely used drug, a pill that you take once a day that covalently links and binds and inhibits the BTK molecule, and that cell is done. And the um, importance of that therapy where... Um, everybody responds. Um, and yet there are patients uh, with about a 20 to 25% risk per year of progression. 
And once we lose that very special target, we can go on to some other medicines like venetoclax, uh, which has also shown benefit in the mantle cells. But we've been looking for something better. Now we've tried high dose chemotherapy and I'm a stem cell transplanter. So the notion of using high dose chemotherapy with stem cell rescue or what your patients will know as an auto transplant has provided much benefit to the patients with mantle cell mm -hmm. and uh, moves out the uh, expected overall survival from three to six years or more. There's a role for maintenance rituximab, FDA approved and has benefits in patients. The small molecule inhibitors, a brutin of venetoclax that we just discussed. But where's the home run? Where's the, again, targeted immune therapy that is going to eliminate this cancer and provide the patient a long term cure? Um, some of your patients may have had an allogeneic transplant, which is truly the immune therapy of someone else's immune system. Maybe it's a brother or sister or some HLA identical donor who's blood destroys the white cells, red cells, and regrows and reconstitutes the normal blood system. And in the process of getting rid of the patient's blood system, gets rid of the white cells, the lymphocytes, the B cells, oh yeah, and the mantle cell lymphoma. So the allogeneic transplant is an immune therapy. And again, I am an allogeneic transplanter. We'll probably talk about the major side effect of allogeneic transplant, which is graft versus host disease. That means that the immune response is not only attacking the blood and cancer, but it's also sometimes attacking the skin, the gut, the liver, causing detrimental inflammatory problems that can be the real bane of the existence of the patient, the quality of life and the difficulties with organ involvement across the whole body has been seen. And those patients are really dependent on immune suppression. So, so where's the home run? The home run is again, CAR-T. Um, and that is um, the company uh, that brought us the uh, AxiCell therapy, uh, the first FDA approved treatment in large cell lymphoma. That company is called Kite. They were purchased by Gilead and they brought forward a very similar construct. I mean, the, the, the actual molecule that's placed into the patient's lymphocytes is exactly the same as what's been used for the last three years in large cell lymphoma. So it binds the same CD19, again, same story. Here comes the car. We're gonna bind and we're gonna then kill the cancer. Um, it's prepared in a very special way because mantle cell frequently has um, lymphoma in the blood. So we have to separate the lymphocytes away. And that's the unique difference between Tocardis and Yazcarta. Otherwise, they're nearly identical therapies. And the prep to do this, the apheresis, the places where you'll receive the therapy, the lymphodepletion chemotherapy, and the three days before we put the special cells in, all the same. The follow-up, staying in the hospital seven to 10 days, staying locally for 28 days, all the same. And the expected toxicities of cytokine release syndrome, that's the fever, achy, flu-like symptoms, or the confusion and neurological problems that can follow patients who have had the cytokine release syndrome. Again, very similar incidents. We maybe should come back and talk more about that because we want to make sure patients understand. But here's the excitement. The excitement is, in that study you addressed called Zuma 2, which began back in 2017, uh, there were um, 60 patients treated and this uh, overall response rate was 93% and the overall complete response rate, couldn't find the cancer, was uh, 67%. So two thirds of the patients, 28 days after getting the Tocardis infused in their body, had no measurable cancer, a complete response, and that response has remained durable. Now the publication uh, that is um, responsible for the FDA's approval uh, showed 27 months of follow-up in patients. So that's not, you know, 27 months, that's just over two years. So let's not get carried away. We have two years of follow-up. And in that population, the response rate was, I have to look at my slide. Yep. 43% uh, remaining in complete response and 67% overall response. So very durable, probably even more durable than what we saw in the original treatment with AxiCell and large cell lymphoma. Similar side effects still needs to be done inside the hospital at centers that have experience managing patients with CAR-T, but higher response rates and uh, they appear to be very durable treatments. And these are for patients who had had, who had, had three lines of therapy previously. So they'd had probably CHOP or bendamustine rituximab. They probably had uh, ibrutinib as one of their therapies. That trial required that they'd had a drug that targeted the Burton tyrosine kinase. 
Now, the FDA, when they made the approval of this therapy in July, uh, recognizing what a game changer the therapy offered patients, did not require that patients go through three lines of therapy. The FDA has authorized the treatment in second line, and I think that's because they really want to help patients achieve long-term disease-free survival and benefit. Now, the physicians will have to decide who should receive BTK inhibitors and who should go right on to CAR T cells, and that's discussion with the patients and the family. And that really is still being worked out, and we're gonna be doing a new trial where we'll be looking at patients who'd had uh, abrutinib up front or who had not had abrutinib yet and using the same therapy to see what the uh, true uh, incidence of benefit is in that second line. But in the meantime, there are um, centers that can provide commercially available uh, therapy with Tocardis uh, today. And in somebody who's gone through uh, all the available therapies, that's a lifesaver. And um, as we decide whether we should um, use CAR T cells in second line, uh, we will, um, that's, a, that's an individual decision at this point for the patients and their doctors. Right. You, you summed up so much. Like I'm in, in, in awe of how you boiled that all down again. Um, that's all I talk about, you know, this is like uh, <laughs> six in the morning till midnight, right? I'm that's sorry. Right. You're not the right person. Um, but, you know, hearing all these great numbers, right? And that, look, it sounds like it's such a great option, especially, I mean, now it's been approved for second line. So what the question I would pose is for mantle cell uh, lymphoma patients and their families, why wouldn't they? Is it just a cost prohibitive issue? I think that's an excellent question. And again, I think we have to make sure that the therapy uh, does not cause more toxicity than the patient's need warrants. And again, um, what I think is gonna happen is we're gonna see less CHOP chemotherapy up front. We'll probably be shifting more to the kinder, gentler bendamustine rituximab, and maybe even in combination with abrutinib in the first line therapy. And the intent of that is to really uh, clear the disease, uh, make sure that we get the highest response rate possible with the lowest toxicities and the frequency of going into the hospital with side effects like neutropenic fevers. So we, we wanna avoid that. I, I think that's where the field is moving. And then the key decision, and again, I'm the chief of transplant, so I don't wanna uh, really, um, malign my own uh, therapy, but whether or not auto transplant continues to be uh, important in the management of mantle cell versus going right on to a targeted cellular therapy is really the next question. And so that decision needs to be made. Um, what we're trying to judge is what's the risk of the patient having cytokine release syndrome or really uh, high impact, very debilitating neurological toxicity uh, a grade three neurological toxicity is when the patient's really unresponsive in the hospital, just laying there, eyes open, frequently having expressive aphasia, can't talk to you, can't find the words, can't attend. And that period of time lasts uh, usually two to three days and patients are being treated with steroids. Now, um, young people like us, we may have uh, ability to have the reserve to get through something like that and, um, and easily bounce back. But if you were 80 years old and having um, the similar treatment options and trying to decide, I imagine the abrutinib therapy would be the more appropriate treatment for somebody who's 80 years old, and at least until it's not working. And guess what? While uh, patients are receiving those uh, better tolerated, maybe not curative, but very well tolerated therapies with very good efficiency of efficacies, uh, we're working on new therapies, right? We're working on kinder, more gentler therapies, less toxicities. And the companies that we're mentioning here are fully committed to trying to improve these uh, treatments. Uh, whereas maybe the drugs that you took for your blood pressure and your uh, diabetes are still the same drugs after 20 years, these drugs will not be the same drugs after five years. We will be moving the um, uh, development curve cycle uh, into a very rapid change because knowledge is what uh, is going to drive the next therapy. And as we learn um, how to help the patients, uh, how to improve the treatments, uh, what happens at the universities will quickly disseminate through pharmaceutical companies to the patient's care. Uh, it's a very exciting time. And it's these small clinical trials that are um, able to demonstrate clinical benefit, but at the same time, we're collecting blood samples and lymph node samples that allow us to test how did it work? How did the car expand? Did it go into the lymph node? Did the, did the lymph node stop making the target? And, um, and how do we make this treatment better? So 
that's we call that the virtuous cycle of correlative clinical trials, and and that's what the that's what these large academic centers are all about. And we're trying to turn that cycle as fast as we can. Now that's a, that's a partnership with our patients. So when your patients go to a cancer center and the doctor says, we have a clinical research trial and we have the standard of care, it's important to listen closely. Again, um, there are very good treatments in the uh, upfront uh, use of uh, Tisacel, Axicel, and uh, again, soon Lysacel. So we want to be able to offer those therapies to people uh, with 60% uh, to complete response rates. Uh, but if you are um, having recurrence of disease after that therapy or, or that therapy is not appropriate, then uh, it's important to uh, maybe consider uh, participating on a clinical trial in order to get access to the more promising treatments. And, and that's the hardest conversation. And bring all your friends, bring your family to the doctor's visit. You're going to need lots of ears to be listening to why you should do this or you could consider these other options. That decision of how to uh, choose um, is a, um, yes, your doctor should be making recommendations, but you too have to participate as you consider the benefits and the risks. I appreciate that because the, the point of being able to talk to you and on our platform is that message of, you know, you rely on the medical experts for a lot of these decisions, but in terms of your, your own care, patients being engaged is really important. Um, so I love that. And their families, right? And their support team. Absolutely. Very, very involved. Um, wrapping this up with respect uh, to your time, I do want to ask about um, one of your specialties, which is, um, you know, graft versus host disease and the management yeah. of chronic and acute. And so just wanted to get your take on um, the different therapies that are available and, and what your thoughts are on the landscape now. Sure. Well, thanks for bringing me back to the allogeneic transplant uh, therapy, which again is the original immunological therapy. Um, as we take a histocompatible uh, blood stem cell, might as well just call that the seed, and we bring some of the lymphocytes from that donor who is HLA identical, put them into our patient's body and let them regrow the immune system. There's a civil war that occurs between the North and the South and the, the donor cells and the recipient cells. And we've given chemo where we're you know, handicapping the recipient's lymphocytes. And so we expect, the, we expect the North to win, okay? We expect that the donor cells are going to eliminate the recipient's blood and, and immune cells. And it's that elimination by an immune therapy, by the immune cells, by the lymphocytes that are going to eliminate the red cells, white cells, the platelets. And if you had myelogenous leukemia, that's the therapy. If you had lymphoblastic leukemia, that's the therapy. If you had aplastic anemia, you just need to grow blood. That's the therapy. It's one therapy for all. But the problem is that the donor's immune cells may attack normal tissues in the body, the skin, gut, liver, especially. And that is a problem called graft versus host disease. So that's, again, that's the north against the south, but now we're hitting the essential parts of the body. And that detrimental immune response um, needs to be stopped because left alone, the immune response is very damaging. It can cause liver failure, it can cause the, the bowel, the GI to have profound diarrhea and infections and all kinds of problems. So what's the treatment? Historically, it's immune suppression, it's steroids and uh, uh, sometimes we can even use antibodies against the uh, lymphocytes themselves. So there have been uh, two FDA approvals of drugs that are able to better control the graft versus host disease problem in the first early stages. We'll call that acute graft versus host disease. And that usually happens in the first 100 days, not to say it has to be the 100 days. But later on, as the immune system grows in the body and exports new lymphocytes out to the body and get educated in lymph nodes and the bone marrow, uh, this dysregulated immune system may have a second uh, series of problems that um, your doctor may call chronic graft versus host disease. So that's not too surprising. The, the acute GVHD was the lymphocytes in the bag as they came in the body, they saw something foreign and they proliferated. So that's the T cells in the bag and that's the initial problem. The, that later problem is the whole immune system regrowing, B cells and T cells interacting in the lymph nodes and the thymus education, the clonal deletion, everything has to be tuned just right. And when it isn't, then you end up with problems that really resemble autoimmune problems, rheumatologic problems, uh, lupus-like problems, scleroderma, 
and maybe even um, rheumatoid arthritis type problems. So, so those are more insidious in the onset, not nearly as dramatic as the rash that you may see in acute GVHD. And the achiness in the joints and the stiffness and the tightness of the skin comes on over weeks and months. Two different processes. I just think it's really important that we kind of clarify that. So um, the upfront treatment of acute GVHD has benefited from a new FDA approval of ruxolitinib. Ruxolitinib is a small molecule inhibitor that is interfering with signaling through the lymphocytes, T lymphocytes. And you'll, you'll hear this phrase, I'll just say it, JAK-STAT signaling. It's a complicated pathway. But it's a, um, again, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, like that abrutinib drug we talked about. And, and just like the imatinib drug that started the whole success of small molecule inhibitors back in 1998. These are um, inhibiting the phosphorylation of signaling molecules. And in the world of molecules, uh, a phosphorylation molecule is as big as your head, okay? It, it is literally, when you attach a phosphorus molecule onto your, your proteins, uh, you have left your mark, okay? And literally, that's what blocks their function. So now if you come in and inhibit that and you prevent the phosphorylation, then that protein's just gonna work and work and work. And so whether it's, chronic myelogenous leukemia and imatinib or CLL and abrutinib or uh, myelofibrosis or myeloproliferative uh, uh, disorders with ruxolitinib. These are drugs that are, again, pills you swallow once or twice a day, very effective. Uh, they have some achiness to the body. There are some side effects. Doctors will talk to you about that. But Ruxolitinib shuts off that T cell and can provide a immediate improvement when the steroids aren't working. So ruxolitinib is now FDA approved. The treatment of steroid refractory acute graft versus host disease has shown very high benefits. Uh, those benefits are persisting uh, at 60 days. And the, the trial of looking at um, best alternative therapy randomized against using Jack, using I'm sorry, I said Jacophy, that's the trade name, ruxolitinib, showed clear benefit for the patients getting ruxolitinib over those who didn't uh, receive that. And they, they received all the other therapies that the doctor had available to them. Best alternative therapy. Now, it wasn't blinded, but it's still a very convincing study. And the FDA approval brings that drug to uh, the physicians to be able to help the patients in the hospital. So I'm on service today and I gave ruxolitinib to somebody with steroid refractory acute GVHD today. And that's uh, fantastic that we have that ability to intervene. It doesn't solve all the problems. They're still gonna have to grow their immune system. We're still gonna have to figure out how to taper down that immune suppression. But that's a big step in the management of acute GVHD. And uh, aggressive steroid refractory acute GVHD um, unfortunately has killed many patients. So this is an important step forward. Thinking about that chronic GVHD problem though, Gosh, yeah. that's a different therapy. And some of my research and others has shown that the B lymphocytes, the things that make antibodies, has played an important role in the development of the chronic graft versus host disease. So in that space, it's a drug against B lymphocytes, abrutinib, that uh, we were able to produce um, really impressive results, 67% uh, overall responses that continued to improve over two years. And the FDA brought that into approval in patients who have second line needs of uh, steroid relapsing or steroid dependent chronic GVHD. So abrutinib is FDA approved after steroids alone don't help the patient. And that that uh, treatment can be uh, very effective. There is a randomized placebo controlled study that has not yet been announced, that should give us a lot of clear gold standard evidence of whether this drug, abrutinib, can also be moved to the newly diagnosed chronic GVHD patients. And so your, your patients should be on the lookout for those results. So those are the exciting news of uh, better treatments, better armamentarians, better, better drugs for uh, the management of graft versus host disease, both acute and chronic. And, um, Clinical trials are, are ongoing in many uh, of these areas, and so we're, we're hopeful there'll be uh, even more advances in the next year. I'm gonna have to um, do regular updates with you because you bring such positive news. <laughs> such well, um, I, I, last question, I promise, but it's just, and it's, I know we don't have a crystal ball, but 
your just thoughts about the state of current or future therapies, I mean, next five years, I know it's a rapidly changing environment. So it's kind of such a huge question for you, but wanted to get your thoughts. Sure. Well, um, so that's my philosophical question. Um, well, let's start with multiple myeloma, a disease we haven't talked about, but many of your patients have this. Uh, there have been many advances in drug therapy since Ken Anderson in 1998, my Dana-Farber mentor, uh, said, you know, you could take thalidomide and dexamethasone and have a better outcome than chemo. And that quickly changed into Revlimid, and that quickly changed into uh, a whole bunch of drugs that now have really revolutionized how we think about the treatment of multiple myeloma. And that's actually changed the survival of patients with multiple myeloma. And you can follow, um, in the first uh, five decades, there was no improvement in the survival of myeloma patients. And now we can demonstrate improved overall survival every two to three years since the development of these small molecule drugs. Um, that's important, right? That, that's, there are patients with myeloma who are being cured. Yeah, there's CAR T's coming into to myeloma, so that's exciting. Uh, we have uh, shown that um, small molecule inhibitors, these uh, phosphorylation inhibiting drugs, these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, imatinib, ibrutinib, ruxolitinib, are having a profound effect and uh, really better quality of uh, treatment uh, for the patients. Uh, a small molecule pill instead of chemo with your hair falling out, that's, that's gotta be good. And having a long-term disease-free survival, hopefully cure, uh, is really advancing that field. So I think the small molecule inhibitors are having a real uh, impact on the indolent cancers. But the patients who have really aggressive cancers, cancers that are dividing and multiplying and doubling every uh, two to three weeks, uh, those small molecule inhibitors usually aren't enough, unfortunately. And this is where um, harnessing the T cells and bringing CAR T cell or T cell engagers, we didn't talk too much about that. Um, you know, you're talking to a CAR T therapist, so let's just say I'm a little bit of a fan. And I've seen these responses uh, and patients go dancing out of the office at day 28, so I'm a big fan. And no GVHD, no graft versus host disease. And um, pretty well tolerated. We would like to improve the tolerability of the therapies and that's what we're working on. So what do I think? Uh, I think the patients who have the blood cancers have benefited from all of the advances and, I, and, and let's bring it on. Let's keep going. Let's make this a, a story of only success. Uh, what do I think is going to be needed are to apply these immune therapies into the tough cancers, the lung cancer, the breast cancer, the prostate cancer, the pancreatic cancer patients, where we haven't had small molecule inhibitors that are truly effective in this sense. Some are coming. The checkpoint drugs, uh, we've seen the benefits in patients with lung cancer. There's some people have really benefited from checkpoint inhibition of their own T cells, taking the breaks off their own T cells and letting the immune cells fight the cancer. That has shown benefit in you know, many cancers. That'll continue, but I think we want to figure out how to bring the cellular immune response into lung cancer, into brain cancer, where we have nothing, and into, um, well, all these diseases that people suffer through with the same old chemotherapies and toxicities in ways that are not always providing long-term benefit uh, and very few cures. So we'd like to cure more and more diseases. And what's the difference? Well, what is cure? People ask me all the time, am I cured? Uh, the difference between remission, where we have no measure of your cancer anymore on a scan or a bone marrow or a blood test and a cure, the difference is time. So these exciting therapies that we're talking about today, when I say I have a patient one year out, I, I hope she's cured, but we need to wait till she comes back to my reunion at five and 10 years and until she brings her kids back, you know? Um, so uh, the difference is time. And I know that your patients don't want to wait for new developments. That's why we have clinical trials. And that's why testing new therapies is a partnership with patients who need treatment today and are able to be educated by their doctors and their care teams so that they understand the risks. And they're getting the best therapies available offered to them quickly mm -hmm. so that they can benefit now. And, uh, you know, I, I have the best job in the world, just in case you asked. It's a bit of a vocation. <laughs> 
Well, it's been honestly a pleasure because you bring this lightness. You're able to make it uh, layman's terms, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, but I love how you characterize it. It is a partnership and such a pleasure. I really hope we can get you again, um, you know, for the next update, Dr. David Miklos, you know? Of course, of course. <laughs> we're, we're, uh, we're, and I would like some of my colleagues to uh, help you with some of these educational uh, uh, messages. Because that's the other thing we do, right? At the university, we train the next generation. And think about that, right? Who's going to do this next? I'm getting old. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. That's a hat you're going to have to keep on for a little while if I have anything to do with it. Um, thank you again, Dr. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to your patients, their families today, and come back anytime, okay? Okay, for the Chief Car T Therapist. Is that what it was? I that love sounds it. good. I like that title, Chief Car T Therapist. Thank you so much. Thank you.